um, even though I am associated with uh, many uh, very erudite institutions and organizations, um, this talk is entirely my own opinion. So please don't go and complain to, <laughs> to some dean or some uh, or professor or whatever. Um, it's in features in a lot of dramas, and uh, it used to feature in Western dramas, in Indian movies, in Cantonese movies, and the latest one is all these K-dramas, which, uh, which are full of uh, uh, heroic, good-looking uh, uh, doctors, which um, unfortunately is not really the case. Um, I say the real thing about medicine is that you must be prepared to cut up people. And it's not about looking good. It's not about having, you know, really uh, glamorous lifestyle, but it's about having the stomach to cut up people. And this is a very unfortunate lady. She um, contracted this infection caused by this bacteria, which you can see on the screen, and it's known as the flesh eating bug. So it started destroying her, her forearm. And in fact, the reality is the very first day in medical school, we are given a lecture and then we are taken to the dissection hall where we are told to start cutting from the shoulder all the way down to the elbow. And so basically, I know many people, very talented, very compassionate, very kind-hearted, but they don't have the stomach for cutting up people. And so I strongly advise them to choose a different career. The other part about medicine, which is very unfortunate uh, uh, in Singapore and in many parts of the world today, is this fact that people get abused, uh, even as they are healthcare professionals. There's been a lot of attention in the media about abuse of healthcare professionals by patients, but actually there are researchers who have done studies in Singapore and you find that patients are the minority of the abusers. There are some patients who have psychological disorders and they, they attack uh, doctors or nurses or healthcare professionals, but unfortunately the majority of um, abuse of junior doctors especially uh, comes from either senior doctors or from um, interestingly enough, nurses. So, um, and this unfortunately tends to get perpetrated. And one of the worst things that was reported in this study was that a significant percentage of junior doctors had things thrown at them in the operating theater. Now, I think it doesn't take uh, an expert to know that having things thrown at you in the operating theater is not only not good, but it's also dangerous. Um, and, and the saddest thing is that some of those people, the junior doctors who had things thrown at them in the operating theater, proceeded to throw things at medical students. So unfortunately, this is kind of the result of the stress that a lot of healthcare workers in Singapore and in many uh, high-income countries are facing. There's also the risks associated with medicine as a profession. And this happened during SARS in 2003, where a very beloved colleague, he was very active in the Salvation Army, um, and he took care of a patient. Uh, and unfortunately, he died because of SARS. Um, this does not happen to any banker or lawyer, as far as I know. None of them have died in the course of their work. Fortunately, during SARS-2 or COVID-19, uh, there have been relatively few healthcare professionals who have been infected in the course of their work. And the majority of the people infected in the course of their work have been transportation workers, as far as the studies have been provided. But despite the fact that healthcare workers have not been uh, disproportionately infected by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, they have faced a huge amount of stress. With every wave, with the Omicron wave, with the Delta wave, there's been more cases and more stress on healthcare workers. And so that has put a considerable strain uh, on the work-life balance, on the mental health and well-being of healthcare workers in Singapore and in other countries. And this has been well documented. And not just that, even as uh, doctors and nurses try their best to try and help patients, uh, we find that sometimes we end up on the wrong end of a lawsuit. Uh, this is from uh, almost 20 years ago, where they talked about malpractice insurance hitting $9,500 a year. Right now, it's about $30,000 a year for obstetricians and $25,000 or above for certain kinds of surgeons. And that's just in the insurance in the event that you get sued. Uh, doctors are not too bad, but they're still behind lawyers. Uh, and both are actually behind uh, uh, the IT and tech individuals as far as the graduates of NUS, NTU, SMU, and SUSS. Um, this is according to MOE, and you can go to the MOE website and, and go and study this in detail. What is interesting is you'll see that doctors have a 100% employment rate. Uh, so do dentists. And so do so almost entirely do teachers, 
And the reason is very simple, they're bonded. <laughs> so once you're bonded, you're guaranteed of employment. But as some of you pointed out, if you really want to earn a high salary in Singapore, uh, you have to be a politician. Then you can afford to live in some really uh, fabulous mansions. Uh, and that's legitimate uh, salaries. There are some people, unfortunately, in Singapore who get into uh, illegitimate activities and the kind of money they make is, is just mind-boggling. But we, I'm sure you don't want to go there or you don't want your beloved children to end up in that kind of profession because eventually you'll get caught. But the numbers don't tell the whole story. Some years ago, uh, a bunch of junior doctors actually calculated in terms of the number of hours that they do, how much money they made and compared it to a McDonald's worker. And they found that they were paid about $3.50 an hour when a McDonald's worker got $4.50 an hour. So basically, the McDonald's auntie is making a little bit more than a junior doctor. Uh, and that's some time ago. Recently, uh, uh, just in the last year, uh, this has come out on social media where um, doctors have found this. This doctor says after about 20 hours at work, he starts losing his grip on reality. It's harder for him to calculate medication doses and make decisions as his thoughts slow to a crawl. He said he finds himself getting delirious and he's not using his real name for obvious reasons. So I still remember this on my first call at work. I saw the morning shift nurses said hello to them. Then the afternoon shift nurses, then the night shift nurses. And then the next day's morning shift nurses, and I'm still there. Uh, and that's the reality of the 36 hour call, which now is cut down to about a 30 hour call. And in some uh, institutions, a 24 hour call, which the junior doctors have to have to face. So this has undoubtedly taken a toll on these junior doctors. And in fact, uh, these are some of the comments they put down on social media. Somebody says less than 4K take home pay after slogging for four years, three years bond remaining chained to my neck. May I know why no one has gone on strike yet? Oh yeah, we are still busy saving lives for what? And this was from a couple of years ago, Rice Media, where, where people pointed out that many sectors doing more than 60 to 70 hours without overtime. Um, and someone else commented that it's not fair to work doctors to the bone, but unfortunately that's the reality of what it is like uh, here. And when people complain, you get this very entitled people whining about their jobs. So you don't get a lot of sympathy from the general public, unfortunately. So that's the starting salary. But actually, uh, people think, okay, so early life is very tough, but you tough it out through the first five years as a junior doctor, you become a surgeon, then your salary will go up. And it is true. Uh, this is, again, from some years ago, um, where they showed that the median wage actually goes up significantly for internal medicine or general physicians. For general surgeons, it goes up, and then it starts to go down. And the reason is similar to for famous athletes. You know, uh, famous athletes like uh, Kylian Mbappe, for example, or Lionel Messi, your salary goes up. But after a certain period of time, there's a peak. And, and the reason is obvious, because general surgery is a discipline which depends on your hand-eye coordination. Nobody wants to be operated on by a surgeon whose hand is shaking or who cannot see clearly. So basically, there's kind of a peak at about 40 to 45 years when the salary of a general surgeon kind of peaks. For a specialized surgeon, it peaks maybe 45 to 49. But after that, it's kind of downhill all the way. And what's the reason why I keep talking about salary? Is it because I'm just money-minded? No, it's not. Because the reality is the dream of every young person in Singapore is to move out and to get away from their parents. And the dream of a lot of parents too is when their kids can move out and they can stop picking up after them and doing their laundry. So the reality, though, is that the resale prices of HDB flats, as I think you know, uh, have gone through the roof. And this is even flats, which are more than 50 years old, which have very little remaining lease value, are going for more than half a million dollars. So if you're making that kind of salary, um, it's going to be really, really hard to, to try and get out of the house. And it also takes a very long time. So the career of a doctor is five years to do the MBBS course. Then you have another year of doing your housemanship then medical officer, national service for those who are disrupted before their uh, medical school, then two to three years of uh, residency or postgraduate, that's assuming you get in the first time round, uh, and then the subspecialty or senior residency, followed by, that's what we call advanced training, followed by two years as an associate consultant, and then finally after nine years, this is in the best case scenario, Assuming you get all the postings of your choice, you pass all your exams first time around. By year nine, uh, after graduation, 
you become a consultant. And this is really true. This is my collection of badges from house officer, resident. Uh, I went away to the US uh, six years, uh, came back senior registrar, consultant, uh, finally senior consultant, and then professor. Uh, my undergraduate metric card was seized because I think they didn't want me using the swimming pool. So the question is, if the life is so tough, the pay is, is so relatively low by, in terms of the hours and the, the career path is so fraught with difficulties, why is it that so many parents want their children to become a doctor? And I think the answer is contained in this Straits Times article from December 2009, which was also reproduced in, in the book by Professor Li Wei Ling. And she talked about uh, a case where she had a friend who phoned her up very distressed. Her husband had a severe head injury. She asked her friend who was the doctor in charge. She said she didn't know. She told her to write down my name and mobile number on a piece of paper, pass it to the most senior doctor there, ask him to call me. The moment the doctor saw the note, he phoned the head of department. My friend had never seen or heard of the head of department. Other doctors in the hospital asked her, who are you and how are you related to Professor Lee Weiling? An hour later, the head of department called me to give me the medical details, sounding as though he had been in charge all along. The next day, a bouquet of flowers from the hospital appeared in the room of my friend's husband. A senior doctor took care of my friend's husband and performed every operation on him personally. My friend's husband had been admitted as a subsidized patient because all emergency admissions are categorized as subsidized. So basically, we have an excellent healthcare system in Singapore. We've got very good doctors, nurses, and we've got excellent infrastructure. The trouble is, it's very complicated and very difficult to negotiate. And I think a number of parents are hoping that they will have a son or daughter inside the system who can help advise them on how to negotiate the system so they do not end up uh, falling by the wayside or slipping through the cracks. So now that you've decided that you want to do medicine, you want to make a contribution, um, and you're not afraid of, uh, of cutting up people and seeing blood, you have to decide where you want to do medicine. Oldest medical school in Singapore is the one at NUS, and it was started in 1905 by Mr. Tan Jiak Kim, who got together a bunch of local merchants and they contributed money to, to uh, make the colonial government start a medical school. Now, both of the undergraduate medical schools use uh, are pretty much the same, okay? And like I said, this is not, this is my personal view. Uh, of course, my boss will claim that we're better. But the, the reality is that we get very good students and we all make use of the latest technologies. One of those is simulation enhanced learning. Now, when I was a young medical student, we learned to take blood and to set uh, drips on old people, uh, the patients in the hospital. So we would poke them, we would have somebody teach us how to poke them and the poor old person wouldn't realize that this is the first time we're doing it or the second time we're doing it. Now it's a lot better. The students practice on dummies. They are very realistic. We have uh, um, a red, uh, red colored dye that goes through the veins so they know when they are in the vein properly and when they have taken blood. So, so it's a lot safer for patients and I think it's a lot better for the students as well. So this is the high technology learning that goes on in medical schools in Singapore. NUS is very proud of the fact that we are a multidisciplinary campus. Uh, my wife was in the business school at the same time that I was in medical school. And we have we are the only school with a nursing school. But NTU is also a pretty uh, impressive multidisciplinary campus. They have uh, a big engineering school. They have uh, lots of communications. They have a journalism and information school, which uh, we don't have at uh, NUS. So I, like I said, either way, you have opportunities for learning at the latest levels and integrated learning as well. Now, it doesn't matter. Now, the reality, everyone thinks that you have to go to a certain JC to, to get into medical school. And it is true that certain JCs tend to prepare their students a little bit better. But we've had students who come through the polytechnic route and they have done really well. So these two were amongst the first uh, poly students to come into NUS. One of them is now an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and the other is uh, is a general surgeon, as far as I know. So so they have done really well, despite not coming through the uh, A-level route. Uh, they gave an interview uh, with the Singapore Medical Association News, and they gave, it was very sweet. They talked about, uh, about how they believed in themselves, stayed focused, regardless of how, uh, you know, society decides to judge them based on their O-level grade. And they didn't allow that to uh, to put them down. So so again, two of the the young surgeons that we have in Singapore came through the polytechnic route uh, and have done really well. Now, having said that, there needs to be a reality check. And if you're going through the A level route, 
this is the um, this is from the NTU website, and basically it tells you what are the grades you need. So if you're in the bottom 10% of the NTU cohort, you have four A's. If you're in the top 90%, you also have four A's. Uh, and that's for medicine. Um, there are certain professions, and this is interesting, engineering now with, uh, with four C's, you can get into NTU according to this website, which is really mind boggling because in my time, uh, engineering was super competitive and you had to have four A's or at least three A's and a B to get into engineering. But that's unfortunately the way things have uh, have turned out. And it's, I think, related to the fact that parents realize that uh, if their children graduate as engineers, they're competing with uh, people coming in from all over the world to work in Singapore, very, which has unfortunately driven down the, um, uh, the salaries of uh, engineers in many uh, disciplines in Singapore. NUS also publishes uh, the indicative grade profile on their website, so you can look it up too. So law, medicine, uh, uh, straight A's, dentistry, straight A's, uh, business analytics, which is now the hot one because, again, they make the most money, uh, computer science. And this is interesting because about 10 years ago, computer science, you got a couple of C's you could get in. Now you need four A's. So it, it's all related to, to the ver varieties of the job market and public policy and things like that. So, so it's quite interesting to see how this has uh, turned out. But if you are not one of those who has straight A's, it doesn't matter. Uh, both schools actually have this so-called aptitude-based admissions. And the minister has just announced that about one quarter of students actually get in on aptitude-based admissions. So in NUS, they put down community service, leadership, sporting achievements, arts and theatre, uh, research and publication. Sounds a bit like DSA, but unfortunately, that's what it is. Uh, NTU, they're a bit more general. They say beyond schools, curricular activities, exceptional talents, uh, and there are certain forms that you can fill in. Uh, the reality about medical school in Singapore is that there, uh, there are bonds. If you are Singaporean, there's five years of bond, excluding your housemanship. Uh, PRs is six years. Uh, and this is made very clear on both uh, universities' websites. Now, if you don't get in, it's not the end of the world, okay? And uh, no one, no less than Mr. Bayam King, the well-known member of parliament, talked about how he didn't get in and uh, and he felt very discouraged, but he went on to become uh, you know, a very successful individual in the media industry. And uh, um, and, and like I said, he's, he's uh, quite a leader in his own right. Uh, there is the Graduate Medical School that's located at Duke NUS in uh, Uttram. Uh, and basically, you need to get a, a first class honors or, or a very good degree. Um, and then you can apply for a postgraduate uh, medical education. But, you know, the reality is everyone who comes into medical school, they tell us during the interview they want to help people. But, you know, I'm an infectious disease physician. And this is one of my favorite slides. It's data from the 20th century in the United States showing the uh, deaths from infectious disease. And basically, you can see the deaths from infectious disease plummeted uh, throughout the 20th century with one spike with the flu pandemic in 1918. But what I want you to pay attention to is that the deaths from infectious disease uh, were reduced long before the first antibiotics and long before the widespread use of vaccination. So why did deaths from infectious disease drop? And they dropped mainly because of the chlorination of water, which got rid of salmonella, and the introduction of state health departments, which put in housing rules. Before this, in New York or Los Angeles, you could have 20 people in a room. But after the introduction of these health departments, they had a maximum capacity for each room, which reduced significantly the incidence of tuberculosis. So tuberculosis started going down, typhoid started going down, infectious disease went down long before penicillin or vaccination. So basically, I tell people, if you want to save people from infectious disease, you don't have to be a doctor. You have to be an engineer or you have to be a public policymaker and architect. And moving on, it's not enough just to think about making money. Uh, a lot of what you want your children to do is to have respect. And in fact, this is a survey done in Singapore where they studied Singapore residents and they tried to find out what were the most trusted individuals. Number one was firefighters. Number two is doctors, number five, surgeons, paramedics, number seven, judges, teachers, and pilots rounding up the top 10. The ones uh, who they were least trusted, real estate agents uh, at number 40, and number 39, politicians, financial planners at 38. So even though they make the most money, real estate agents, politicians, and financial planners are not generally trusted by the Singapore population. So in summary, 
Should you or your child take our medicine? The question is, do you want to and why? Do you mind long hours and irregular schedules? Do you like people even when they're at their worst? Do you want to help people even at the expense of your own comfort? And are you, like me, unsuitable for engineering or firefighting? If your answer is yes to all of the above, I think medicine can be an emotionally rewarding career. Okay, the question is from Brian Go, and the question is, have you ever gotten so tired after the 36-hour call that you could not walk or talk? And the answer is no. And the thing I've done is I've, I've learned the skill of taking cat naps. So I can go to deep sleep in a five-minute <laughs> interval. And uh, I, I remember I was at, uh, I was waiting for something and oh yes, I was on a plane on the way to the US and there was a screaming kid next to me. And uh, this poor pa uh, passenger on the other side just couldn't sleep the whole time. But I was able to sleep for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, deep sleep, wake up. And she said, how in the world do you do that? And I said, I'm a houseman. And so I'm used to, to taking 10 or 15 minute naps, but it's not a great idea. And uh, as Don said, yes, indeed, it is unhealthy. And in fact, uh, one of the mo one of the hospitals that actually um, took the lead in getting rid of the 36 hour call, um, the motivation was very sad. There was one of the housemen who was driving down Clementi Road and he fell asleep and he crashed his car into a tree and died. And uh, uh, and that was the, the that really shook up everyone. Okay, next question um, is from Kara Lee. If you could retire now, what would you like to spend the rest of your life doing? Ha <laughs> ha! That's a great question. That's what my wife and I have been. We've been interviewing people. Um, we've got about seven more years before we reach the the uh, retirement age, uh, and we've seen some good examples and some bad examples. Uh, and, and what I would really like to do, I'm actually kind of in a in a good place in my career in which I. I teach the students I want to teach. I do research on the subjects I want to do, and I generally see the patients I want to see. So, so that's kind of like what I would like to do is maybe you know be a visiting consultant somewhere and uh, uh, see patients once in a while. You know, for second opinion or third opinion. Uh, I'd like to read books. Uh, I'd like to keep up with interesting developments. I, I really, you know, I'm a, a academic, so I'd like to find the answers to some questions. Like, for example, why don't some people get COVID? Or, you know, why do some people get bad flu and other people just get a runny nose for a couple of days? So, but I don't want to do the work myself when I'm at this point. See, I, I would rather help some younger person to, to write a grant and, and design the experiment and do the study. Okay, next question. What is done to improve the work-life balance of doctors from Grace Tan? And uh, she also asked, doesn't that affect your health in the long run, the lack of sleep? So um, I'll answer the first part uh, first. And what I do is um, I have this uh, this Sabbath thing where on Sunday, uh, I, I don't do any work at all. And I, I, I mean, I go to church in the morning and then I have lunch with my mom and, and then I just sleep the whole afternoon, which is kind of... Uh, you know, it's not the best way of doing it, but it's a way of trying to get around the the, the working ridiculous hours during the during the week. Um, and, and I and I now try and and do something about you know cutting it down. But again, I'm very senior. Um, I do uh, try and help the younger doctors. I'm an advisor to the Singapore Medical Association's Junior Doctors Committee, and uh, uh, and what we do is we have been lobbying, and MOH to their credit have been listening. Um, but they keep trying to tell us if you reduce the number of hours, we've got to increase the number of doctors. It's going to be more competition for specialist posts and, you know, typical kind of uh, bureaucratic answer saying that, you know, you better be careful what you wish for. So so it's it's something that um, that I think um, is very challenging. OK, there's another question from Brian. Go again. Have you ever been bitten by a patient or, or hit? And I have never been hit by a patient. I I actually have been bitten by one patient, and this guy unfortunately was um, was massively overdosing himself on uh, amphetamines. Uh, and I still remember he he um, he attacked the nurse. Uh, we had to call security, and unfortunately, you know, the security in many hospitals are these old men, and they were. Uh, and so I had to go in and help out. And uh, another fellow houseman came along, and there were four of us trying to hold him down while one of us was trying to give him an injection of a sedative. 
Um, and it, it was an experience I really do not want to, to replicate. Not a great idea. Okay, next question from Beverly. What was the longest time you did? And um, uh, generally, I think it was a 36, or almost 40 hour call because um, we were short of people. So, and this was, bear in mind, this was 25 years ago when I was a junior doctor. Uh, and, and the worst part about it was that I went home, slept for about four, uh, eight hours, and then came back the next morning and started again. So, so you know, this is really kind of dangerous. And uh, and like I said, Ministry of Health is aware of it. They are trying to do something about it. Many of the departments have uh, have done away with the thirty six hour call, but not all of them. Okay, next question from Udon Sap Hope. Uh, hypothetically speaking, if a 13-year-old with no experience with medical stuff at all wants to pursue medicine, how many years will it take them to earn $5,000 plus a month? Okay, um, currently the salary for a junior doctor is about $4,500. So, um, so it will take probably about two or three years. Although if they have no bond, uh, they can go and... Uh, so like if you're not studying at a local university, if your parents are rich enough to send you to Australia or UK... And then you come back, uh, you join one of the big GP groups. Uh, from what I've heard, their starting salary is about 6000 a month. So um, uh, so you can uh, potentially earn that very soon after graduation if you do not have a bond. Okay, Brienne asked this question, uh, would you encourage young people to do medicine? And the answer is yes, I do. But I would encourage them to go in with their eyes open. So a lot of them come and do internships or job shadowing programs with me. And I always insist that they come back to the hospital at five o'clock and they stay through the night. If they have uh, transport, then stay after midnight. If they don't, uh, to leave at 11.30 and follow a junior doctor around. And then they can see the real life. I said, the real life is not some specialist like myself giving some fancy lecture or doing some experiment or you know, treating some uh, uh, complicated patient. Real life is a junior doctor running around, you know, trying to catch up on the work that's just piling up one admission after another. So if you actually um, do that kind of thing, then, uh, uh, and if you if you still enjoy it, if you get the adrenaline rush from trying to help people, even though uh, uh, it's, it's very challenging and you find it intellectually and socially satisfying, then I think you should definitely do it. Uh, Beverly asked this question, have you ever gotten a virus from a patient? I don't think so. Uh, I did get chickenpox as a, as a house, as a medical officer, second year MO, but I actually got that from my wife and she got it from one of her students. She's lecturing in uh, in NUS. So so the chickenpox was from there. Um, um, but no, I, as far as I know, I don't think I got any viruses from patients. Maybe you know, I grew up in the 1960s and we used to go running around in the back of the yard uh, catching spiders. So I think we we caught all kinds of viruses. So by the time I was a graduate at the age of 26, 27, I was immune to most of these things, except chicken pox. I don't know how I escaped that. Okay, next one from Clara. Did your parents have any hand in your decision to work in healthcare uh, or was it entirely your decision? I'm glad you asked that question. Because my father was a physician. He was a diabetes specialist. He was very highly regarded. In fact, his obituary is online. You can look it up, John Tambaya. And, uh, you know, he tried his best to discourage me from doing medicine. Uh, and I still remember Christmas Day, uh, we were all gathering together for a family uh, Christmas lunch. And he had to go out and find a surgeon to take out a kidney from a patient who was dying from a diabetic patient with a kidney infection. And my mother says, see, that's what happens when you become a doctor. But uh, in spite of that, you know, as a kid, you look up to your parents. And and, and my dad was a very uh, well-respected individual in the medical field in Singapore. And I think he was a role model and an inspiration. Ha, huh, Ray and Go, how long was your total education? It's mind-boggling. Okay, so I graduated in 1988. Then I started, then I did my NS. And then I did my uh, postgraduate. And I finally got certified as a specialist in 1999. So having started in primary one in 1971, so 1999, that's 28 years. Okay, so my total education was 28 years, which I think is older than some of you all. Okay, Brienne, do you think whole schoolers have a disadvantage in applying for medical school? 
Okay, the answer is I don't think so. But again, I don't know enough about homeschooling. And I think one of the biggest things has got to do with um, socialization and your opportunities for doing service. Um, I told Dawn this story about how, you know, certain junior colleges, um, uh, they do very well at preparing their, uh, their students for medical school and for the interviews. And they seem to have this formula. And one of the things that they do is they have their students volunteer every week at an old folks home. Then they do some lab attachments, they do some research projects. And I think personally that volunteering every week at an old folks home is critically important. Uh, I've told other students that, you know, if you cannot even go once a week for one hour and listen to an old person tell you stories, then you should forget about doing medicine. Because in reality, 80% of medicine is listening to old people tell you stories. Uh, and so, you know, those who do not have the opportunity to, during COVID, you couldn't go to old folks' homes or, or nursing homes. So I told people, go and find your oldest relative, your grandfather, grandmother, grand aunt, and try and spend, you know, twice a week, just sit there and listen to them tell you stories or help them get out and go to the park downstairs. Because I think that's, that's uh, really, really important. It's learning how to 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 deal with older people, how to listen to them, how to treat them with respect, and uh, and and I think uh, you know if the homeschool can tie up with some uh, old folks home or senior citizens home or something like that, that would be that would be tremendous. Okay, Beverly asked the question: How long have you been working here? And I just got my thirty year long service award. <laughs> it's thirty years. Actually, I think it's thirty two years, but they, I I think they discounted my two years of NS. So. So it's 32 minus two years, uh, two years of NS. Okay, uh, what is the hardest job you have done in medicine? The question is from Emma, and that's a really good question. And I can tell you the hardest job I've done in medicine has been in pediatrics, which is telling a parent that their child is gonna die and that we have tried everything we could and that there's just nothing that we can do. Uh, and this child is going to die. And it's really, really hard. And, you know, at the beginning, I wanted to do pediatrics as a career. But I found that, unfortunately, that's, that happens um, even in Singapore, you know, where we have very, very good um, medical care, uh, especially in pediatrics. Yeah, there are some children you cannot save. Uh, and, and, I, and I just couldn't take it emotionally. And so that was that was truly, truly the hardest thing I've ever done in medicine. Brian Go, have you ever lost a patient? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, every time uh, every time I'm on duty, we lose one patient, uh, and that's about the average. <laughs> there are some people who are known as the angel of death. They lose two, three patients every time they're on duty. Uh, but I think I'm about average, um, and I lose about one patient uh, every time I'm on duty. Uh, ideally, it, wants, it should be a planned uh, death, and this is what uh, I, I've learned how to do. Uh, so some old person comes in after a fall and they've really had a very tough time. They have advanced cancer, they've got kidney failure, uh, and they're really not going to get better. And so we sit down with the old person. Very often I sit down with the old person before I talk to the family and I say, look, you know, do you want us to put you on dialysis? Do you want us to put you on a breathing machine? And the old person says no. And, and I've actually had situations where they say, I know my children will want to keep me alive, but please don't do that. So, so I sit down and I tell them, uh, look, okay, I respect what you say. And I talk to the children and I say, look, you know, your father or your mother has, has had this conversation. I do it in front of the old person. And I say, they've had this conversation with me. So, you know, let's try and make things comfortable for this person so they don't have to suffer. Um, and and uh, I get the palliative care experts and they, they get involved. And, and, and that's the kind of uh, way in which I've lost patients in the last few years. Uh, uh, once or twice, we get unexpected loss, and that that really causes a lot of soul searching. I had somebody who had a heart valve that was infected, and we were scheduling this patient for surgery. And then, unfortunately, something went wrong. And, uh, actually, just the, the infection got out of control, or it just happened to hit that part of the heart that controlled the, the rhythm uh, and after we finished the ward round, we turned our back and he collapsed. We had to do CPR on him, but we couldn't bring him back. So, so that's the exception. Most of the time, it's people who we know are not going to do well, and then we we try and prepare them for a good death. Uh, next question from Kizaya, uh, Sulin, and Jonah, and it was, how did you specialize? Decide to specialize in infectious disease, and this is one of my favorite stories. So uh, as an MO, after I came out from the army, my first postings were actually in cardiology. And uh, my consultant in the ward was uh, Professor Morris Chu, who some of you may know, he's a very well-known and respected cardiologist. 
Uh, he's one of the leaders at Farrah Park Hospital. And he said to me, would you like to do cardiology as a career? And I said to him, no, there are too few diagnoses. You either have heart failure, you have a heart attack, or you have a heart rhythm problem. Then he said to me, you should do infectious disease. There are thousands of, inf of diagnoses. You could have a virus, you could have a bacteria, you could have a fungus, you could have TB. And he was trying to be funny. But I went home and I thought about it. And I said, hey, that's me. You know, I like the detective work. I like trying to pinpoint who is the culprit, you know, putting all the clues together. Uh, and, and so after that, I went on to do infectious diseases. Okay, next question. What do you find most rewarding about your work? And again, this is related to the earlier question. The, the best part about infectious disease is making the right diagnosis and giving the right antibiotic or right antiviral. You know, it's very easy to give a patient five different antibiotics, and then if the patient gets better, then okay, let's. So you don't know which one works. But it's more challenging to design the right test, uh, you know, not subject the patient to a whole battery of tests, but choose the right test that's going to give you the answer, and then choose the right drug. So so I think this is... Uh, um, <clears throat> this is to me the most the most satisfying, but that's that's my personality. Like I said, I I grew up on detective novels, so I like finding the culprit and and, and locking them up, or, or in the case of bacteria or viruses, getting rid of them. Okay, next question: Have you ever been disgusted by cutting an arm? Okay, and I can tell you the truth. The reason why I decided not to do surgery was when I went to the operating theater. It's not so much the cutting. But when they cut, they actually have to burn off the blood vessels and they use uh, uh, heat. It's a procedure called diathermy. And that really uh, uh, turned me off, the, the nausea from the smell of burning flesh. So I decided I cannot do that for the rest of my life. Because if you're a surgeon, you have to do that. You, know, you don't just cut people up. You've got to you know, stop the bleeding and you know, sew them back. I also have very poor hand-eye coordination. Uh, I cannot do any sewing. If anything goes wrong at home, my, my wife will call my father-in-law because she knows if she asks me to try and fix it, it will get worse. So uh, so I'm, I'm not a surgeon anyway. Okay, Beverly, have you ever treated a child that was in a critical condition? And, and the answer is yes, and I'll, I'll never forget this. Uh, I'm not a pediatrician, but as a houseman, I had to do a rotation in pediatrics. And I remember it was, um, it was Christmas Day, and there was this child that came in uh, unconscious, and it was really sad. We had put the child in ICU, and we were trying to get a surgeon to try and figure out, because we found there was some internal bleeding in the brain, and we couldn't get a neurosurgeon because they were, they were doing other emergency operations. And finally, we got a general surgeon, and the general surgeon realized that not only did the child have bleeding in the brain, but she also had a, a ruptured spleen. And it turned out that this was a case of child abuse. And, and that was really, really sad. And to have that happen on Christmas Day was even doubly, doubly sad. Uh, and they, she tried her best. She went in, she tried to repair the bleeding, but uh, unfortunately the child passed away. And uh, the child was actually a child with Down syndrome. So so it was really, really hard. And, you know, I think the parents, uh, the father eventually uh, got arrested. And, uh, but it was it was really heartbreaking, the, the whole sequence of events. And again, another reason why I think um, uh, I didn't want to do pediatrics. I couldn't take it. I, I respect the pediatricians who, who have the ability to deal with this kind of thing. Okay, Berean Go. If you think you are good with old people, do you think you stand a good chance? Definitely. I can tell you that uh, there's one of my classmates who was not the top student, uh, but he did, he went into geriatrics. And, and part of the reason why, um, you know, he used to take um, uh, a long time with exams is because he used to take, we used to call him very lost soils. He would sit down and he would talk to all these old people. And so the time would be up before he had finished doing the case. But he became the head of geriatrics at one of the major hospitals. And I can tell you, most of our classmates send our grandparents or parents to him because he's very patient. And uh, so in a way, he's very long, uh, long suffering and, and very successful as a geriatrician. And, and ultimately, that's what counts. You see, once you get in, it's, uh, as I always tell people, the, you know, I take the students who who fail the final exam and, uh, and most of them eventually pass. I tell them, look, the grades don't matter because what do they call the person who comes in last in medical school? And the answer is doctor. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether you're a straight A student or a straight C student, you just have to pass. Have you ever treated, Beverly, have you ever treated a patient over 100? Yes, I have. 
Although, you know, the reality is I'm a bit suspicious about her, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm not so sure that she's really 101, 102. She was quite fit. And uh, her, her younger sibling told me that, um, you know, she migrated to Singapore around uh, uh, in the 1920s. And apparently there were very strict rules. There was the time in China, there was this uh, uh, warlords. So there was a ban on, on younger women traveling. So all the women claimed to be older than they were. And there was a ban on older men traveling. So all the men claimed to be younger than they were. So that otherwise they would get conscripted into some warlord's army. So they, they claimed that they were a certain age. They arrived in Singapore at St. John's Island in quarantine. And then the colonial government just wrote down whatever age they claimed they were. So, so I think it's a little bit suspicious. I mean, unless you were born in Singapore in 1923, uh, I'm not so sure whether you're really 100 years old. Okay, Berean Go, have you ever seen a colleague die? And, and the answer is yes. And that was really, really sad. One of my best friends had advanced cancer. And, uh, and the saddest part about it was actually I diagnosed him because uh, he had this persistent fever and pain. And he came to see me because he thought he had an infection. And something about it didn't, didn't quite seem like an infection because it had been going on for a while. So I sent him for a scan and it showed that he had an advanced tumor in his chest. He went for surgery, he went for chemotherapy. He was incredibly brave through the whole thing. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the, the cancer kept relapsing and, and breaking through the chemotherapy. And, and, and I was there the day before he passed away. Um, and when he died, uh, the hospice called us up and we went there. It was very, very, very sad. Okay, Tsun Sin, is it true that antibiotic resistant bacteria is most prevalent in hospital? Is using antibacterial hand wash body foam useful? Okay, and uh, yeah, and she's also said that there is this, this true about this 100 year olds, maybe not really 100 years old. So, antibiotic resistance is a problem in hospitals. Uh, antibacterial hand wash, the downside about it is that it tends to um, uh, break down the skin and it's uh, irritating to the skin. And that actually can be counterproductive because what happens is in between, you know, bacteria can multiply uh, in the cracks in your skin, and uh, and that's very tricky. Uh, um, so what I tell people, I have some people who have um, uh, immune system problems. There's this guy. Um, every time he goes for his reservist, he has to wear a uniform. He sweats, and then he gets skin infections. So. Um, so I, he was very happy. I wrote him a letter and said he should be excused uniform so he can go for his reservist and PT kit. But in reality, what I do is I tell him to use an antibacterial hand wash, but to use it on alternate days to reduce the amount of bacteria on his skin. And I tell him on the other day, you use the um, the most gentle kind of wash, like uh, uh, some kind of baby lotion so that it can restore your skin. So, so you know, in between, you have the antibacterial and then the baby lotion to, to get around it. A uh, similar question from Brian, does sanitizer that claims to remove 99.9% .9 actually do that? And the answer is yes, but 0.1% is a lot, okay? You know, when you're talking about 100,000 bacteria, if you remove 99.9%, .9 you've removed 99,900, you've left 100 bacteria on the skin. And for viruses, we're talking much more than 100,000. We're talking about millions of viruses. So sanitizer can reduce the number of bacteria, like for my patient who gets the recurrent skin infections, but it does not actually uh, eliminate them. So you still need to do all the other things that, that need to be done. Yeah, doing it twice, you reach a cap. Like, it's not going to make any difference. So Grace Tan asked a very good question. How do you cope with or deal with being around death so often? And again, this this has got a lot to do with personality, and I can't. Uh, I'll be first the first to admit that I, one of the attractions of infectious disease is that most of your patients get better. Okay, you you find the right drug, the right antibiotic, they get better. Um, I, I trained during the early days of the HIV epidemic, and it was really sad to see these young men dying <clears throat> of all these uh, infections. <clears throat> but nowadays, uh, nobody dies of HIV anymore because HIV is considered a long-term curable, uh, uh, not curable, but at least controllable disease like diabetes. So I, I truly respect my colleagues. One of my classmates is a palliative care doctor, and she sees patients die all the time. But I, I find it very difficult for myself as, a, as an individual to, to deal with it. I do have patients die, 
uh, like patients with a flesh eating bug, sometimes they die, or patients with TB that's drug resistant or very difficult to treat, sometimes they die. Uh, and, and I find it difficult to, to deal with. I'll, I'll be the first to admit that. Okay, Brian Go asked this question Have you prescribed the wrong prescription? Uh, and the answer is yes. And uh, the good thing is that we have these uh, systems in place. So uh, so we have pharmacists that, that come and pick up these things. If you prescribe a drug that is uh, uh, either too low or too high a dose or something that the patient may be allergic to, um, uh, the pharmacists are really good and they will call us up. Every clinic session, the pharmacist calls me up once. Uh, and sometimes it's because of a wrong prescription. Sometimes it's because the pharmacists can't believe that I'm using this drug to treat this patient. So I have to tell them, look, there was this study done in this place where they use this drug. And they say, oh, okay, thank you. Okay, question, what is the most, uh, from Vivian Quick, uh, what is the most prevalent infection in Singapore now that causes death? And the answer is actually pneumonia. Um, pneumonia is the most prevalent infection that causes death. It causes death uh, primarily in older people. In fact, uh, uh, one of the greats of medicine is Sir William Osler, and he described pneumonia as the old man's friend or the old woman's friend, because basically some old people who have um, chronic illnesses uh, they get an episode of pneumonia, they're sick for two or three days, and then they pass away. Uh, and in a way, you know, that's kind of a, a, a good way to go. Because uh, as long as you're not having trouble breathing or you're not having a lot of phlegm that's choking you up. Um, I have a 93-year-old relative. We keep a, a, a suction machine next to her. We have uh, nurses who come in and look after her. Um, but I'm fully aware that at some point in time, she may develop a pneumonia, which may uh, take her away. But, you know, uh, right now the, the church is visiting her. They're providing her communion. She's in a community. Uh, and so I'm sure that she'll be ready when her time comes to go. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the things that's really impressed me is young people in Singapore are different from, uh, from the older folk. And uh, they're exposed to a different kind of world. They're exposed to, to social media. Um, and I think uh, a lot of them are a lot more conscious of social issues, um, of things like climate change, of, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the fact that there are poor people around them uh, and, uh, and that there is ability to do something about it. So, so I think uh, my vision of Singapore is that, you know, people feel free to, to ask questions uh, about why things are, about why things uh, are not, and, and that they hold uh, our leaders, including myself, you know, accountable for, for the positions of responsibility that we're in. That, you know, if we are given a position of responsibility, we need to, to really be aware of, of who we're responsible to and who we're responsible for. And if we're not performing, you know, we just need to, to sit up and listen and, and do something about it.